I was gonna say, <laughs> gonna say something, but I better just do that off air, not on air. I'll tell you something we'll have to do. No, you can say anything you like, yeah. it cuts we'll out. Cut it. I we'll cut, cut it out. <laughs> Go on. Shall we say my wife before the exams? Oh, I'm leaving that in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that bit in. Please like, subscribe, comment, and hit the notification bell for any future videos. Well, we were up and running because people won't notice about my, you, Michael, which is uh, I do, is you are one of the very few people who has done the knowledge fully twice. Yep. And also are a cab driver in Brighton. Yeah. Well, I got my badge originally in 1977. Let's go back a bit. I yep. was a police officer. Knocked on a motorcycle in 1975. I thought, am I going to get better? Don't know. Started doing the knowledge originally as a form of insurance. Realised I wasn't going to get any better. And then in July, I think it was, 1977, I asked them to retire me on ill health grounds, which they did. Mm -hmm. And I became a cab driver just after the Queen's Silver Jubilee. 1977. 77, yeah. So give us the story, because you have a unique perspective of the knowledge then to the knowledge when you did it in the early 2000s? 2004. Early Just 2000s. Not long after you started. No, no. Well, I started in 96, so yes, eight years into that. And uh, But I know me and you have known each other for 20 years now. Yeah, exactly. So... We, we um, two years of, of me coming backwards and forwards and saying, what about so-and-so and so-and-so? Well, I think coming backwards and forwards to get you to send me stuff in the post in the old days. Yeah, because he was away then. But what, what can you tell these people today about the difference between the 77 knowledge to the 2004 knowledge? Okay, let's... Well, I can tell you the difference between 77, 2004, and, the, uh, and today's ones. Mm -hmm. um, 77, you had 486 or 468, can't remember the figures. 468. 468. And you oh, runs, just in case runs, they didn't. Yeah, 468 runs, runs in 1977. You started up, you signed on, uh, you paid your five shillings, and you went up into uh, Upper Street and got a photograph done, and you're away at Manor House to Gibson Square. What did you pay the five shillings for? Photograph. Oh, that was the only expense, wasn't it? The yep. expense was the, the photograph. Only expense, yeah, the only photograph. That's all you paid. Um, so you paid that, and you'd come back 104 days. Yeah. And then usually, nearly always, you go down to 56s. Yeah. Uh, and you kept going. What used to happen is you start doing the runs, page by page, and you go up, and they'd, they'd ask you questions based on different runs, different different places. And always they'd find something. Well, I'm going to do that next week. Oh, they always get to that point, mm -hmm. but you kept there, and, and you got your 21s, 14s in those days. 14s, I did yeah, 14s. 28s, 21s, 14s, and then eventually, I think it was Mr. Miller said, told me, so you know, fast, mm -hmm. do the suburbs. So I did the suburbs. I couldn't get about it straight away because I was in the police force still at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Changes yeah. then. Uh, and so I went to see the CMO, chief medical officer, and said, retire me out. He did. Became a cab driver. First job I ever had, I uh, picked the cab up from London General, manual. Yeah. My left foot, boy. Yeah. My left leg was that. People don't really know, do they? Bloody hell. And the steering wheel, you had to have arms like Buddy Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. to turn you those things. Yeah. Uh, well, Popeye afterwards. So <laughs> <laughs> Depends what you're doing at the time, really. Uh, so we um, did the driving test and uh, first job. I put, got all the way from London General Cab Company, right to Victoria, picked up my first job, who went to the West London Air Terminal. Dave, do you know where the West London Air Terminal is? No. Is it Battersea Airport? Nope. Wait, West London Air Terminal? West London Air Terminal. They used to have a uh, bus service that went from West London all the way to Heathrow. And it was called the West London... Air Terminal. It's where Sainsbury's is, in Cromwell Road. Well, what's that then? What, 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 where Sainsbury's is in, in, in Cromwell Road now was the West London Air Terminal. And they used to have double decker buses towing a trailer. The all the luggage went in the trailers, and they'd off off down the down the airport. My very first fare ever. Yeah, was, was that there. one? Well, and you gave it for free that one? Yeah, I did. West yeah. London term. Well, uh, can you tell us how long that took? Uh, a lot less than now. Yes. A lot less time than now. In seventy-seven. Yeah, hardly anything. Uh, and then gradually, I sort of um, I bought my own cab. I commuted part of my pension, bought my own cab, joined London Wide as it was then. Two days after I bought my cab, I was on London Wide, and they were digging holes into it. I think, oh, you know, and went on London Wide. I was quick on the button. What's London Wide? Was that one of the radio circuits? One of the radio circuits. You had I, Lords. I never heard of that one. 
Lords, Mount View. Yep, Mount View I heard of. Yeah. London Wide became Comcab or Computer Cab. I had sort of four years, a run everywhere. I used to go south of the water. South of the water, mate. No, yep. I, yep. North, south, east, west, didn't care where I went. And people said, well, there's no work down there. I said, well, you're lucky. I said, well, do you put your light on when you go down there? Oh, no. Put your light on. I have, in my time, certainly no, even in those days, I've worked Upminster, Uxbridge, Edgware, East Croydon, Bromley, nearly all of the, um, uh, Richmond, Richmond is yep. a very good one. Yeah, Richmond's uh, still all, okay. All the uh, suburban ranks of a night time, uh, if there was empty, if there's no mm -hmm. cabs there, I just work and take the punters. Do you know where you're going yet? Tell me where you're going, then fine. Or, or look it up. No, G no GPSs yeah, in those yeah. days. I didn't care where I went. And I worked on the basis that if I can, I keep going back until a yellow badge came up. Because mm -hmm. I can work anywhere, they can't. Yep. So that's what I, thought, well, I, I didn't that. mind when the yellow badge came back. I carried on. If there's a rank and it's full of people uh, in the yeah. station, yeah. I still yeah, well, kept on picking yeah, them up. Yeah. You done it? I mean, no. What's that? Oh, you've never, never worked at a suburban rank? No. <laughs> they're all they're all they're all all London ranks. Yeah, I know, but what what am I doing out there? I live in London and No, you get a fair in town and they say oh, I want to go to Richmond. Out there. So it goes yeah. to oh, Richmond. You, you go past Richmond and you set them off. And as you go past the station, there's five hundred people standing outside the station at night thinking, Where's the cab? I would always pull on and say, yeah. I don't know where you want to go, but you tell me and I'll take yeah. you. Yeah. Oh yeah, like yeah. Like, like the O2 or something. One one night in modern times, uh since I've been back I got to Richmond. The locals didn't want the job. They went to Car Sholton, then on to somewhere else, uh, Sutton, and then back down to Kingston. And why wouldn't they not want their job? Well, they didn't know it was going to three different places. Oh. Uh, oh. Yellow badge for, for, for Richmond? What are they going to do way out in the sticks? I can do anywhere. Yeah. So a lovely little job that was that night. Anyway, that's the history. Mm. So back to the history. Yeah. Um, after four years or so, I got bored. I wanted a different mental challenge, and I took a printing branch, guys, in Gosport in Hampshire. Yeah. Built it up over 10 years or so. Lost everything in the recession of the 90s, 80s rather. Built it up again uh, on my own, and lost everything in the recession of the 90s. I had two major clients who went bust taking me with them. Mm -hmm. I was doing all right, and I'm that point. I thought, what do I do? Come with the cab trade. Yep. I let my license, London license lapse. No good that. So I thought, what I do? I did the knowledge for Brighton, which takes five months. Yeah. Drove a Brighton cab for six years in total. The last two and a half years of which is when I redid the knowledge, met you the first time. And uh, the difference is that in Brighton, there's a lot of young people who don't have life skills. And you're not treated with the respect that a London cab driver gets. <laughs> Apart from which, for every two pounds they take, I take, f I take three. Yeah. I'm still in contact with the drivers that are down there a very good friend of mine down, down there, guy I first drove for. So I came back, up and down. I used, what I used to do, I was working five nights a week. I would, on a Monday, I'd finish my uh, Sunday night shift. I'd come up on the Tuesday to my call of a partner, Tuesday afternoon, when I'd woken up. Uh, and that we, He was in Thornton Heath. Guy called uh, Steve Meffham. I um, remember Steve. Steve, yeah, yeah. yeah. A very good guy. Um, the, now in, out in Thailand. Oh, uh, yeah. Has been for, for over 10 years. I'd come up, we'd do callovers on a very strict basis of time. Mm. Not how many runs can you do. 15 minutes, and it was very much business-like. I'd come up on the Wednesday, I would have pre-prepared my runs. I'd spend eight, nine hours doing runs from, like, you know, five o'clock in the morning, I'd leave. Go down to Steve's 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening, and leave there, gone 10 o'clock. We'd call over again. And then third, the rest of the week, I would be at my computer at home preparing runs for the following week mm -hmm. and then coming up and calling up. And I, I used to put them into little booklets. I, I, them. I remember you being super meticulous. You drove me insane. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it. Put these things in a little book. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting on a ranks in, in Brighton, a good friend of mine. We sit next to each other and he's, he's saying, you know, Manor House to Gibson Square, whatever it might be, and off we'd go. Uh, he wouldn't know whether I was going, whether I'd written out wrong, but he'd know if I'd said it wrong up against the book. Uh, it, it was absolutely invaluable. So yeah. somebody they're doing it all yeah. the time. You do not have to do things. Now, I discovered as part and parcel of my time when I was in the printing business, I used to continually read books on how the brain works, uh, learning how to 
memorize things. So, Dave, how oh. good is your memory? Useless. Okay. Let's try a little experiment, yeah? Okay. I'm going to ask you a multi-digit number. Yeah. And we're going to do the exercise twice. Having asked you the first one, you repeated it, I'll never ask you for it again. So here comes the first number. Two, three, five, four, eight, seven. What's the whole number? Two, three, four, five, eight, six, seven. He's right, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now we'll do the same exercise again, right? With a different number entirely. Forget the first one, I'm not, not going to ask you again. All right. Okay. Here comes the second number. One, seven, eight, zero, six, five, two, one, eight, four. No chance. Let me just tell you what's happened. The human brain has a short term memory of seven plus or minus two. Some people remember five, some people mm -hmm. remember nine. The second number I gave you is 10 digits. And what's interesting, you don't just forget the beginning or the end of the middle, you forget it all. It gets completely nestled, muddled up. You get into a mucking yep. fuddle. Yep. Be careful, I, I said a mucking fuddle. Yep. And um, so you have to find strategies and ways of doing it. We call it chunking. So Dave, yes. he's done it so he can't, he's not allowed to do it. Well, I'm right. certainly up for chunking. <laughs> <laughs> As long as you're not <laughs> having a blurring occurring. <laughs> oh, why, why is it called chunking? Are we you, about to you, find out? You're about to find out, yeah. Right. So you divide that into chunks. Okay. So the first part of that number is 178. So repeat after me, 178. 178. And again. 178. And again. 178. And again. 178. And again. 178. One more time. 178. Not, not too fast, okay? So the first part of the number is? 178. Great. The second part of the number is 065. Repeat after me, 065. 065. And again. Zero six five and again zero six five and again zero six five and again zero six five one more time zero six five what's the first part of the number backwards eight seven one and the second part normal forgot <laughs> five six zero <laughs> zero six you want you going backwards zero six five yeah I thought you wanted it backwards okay. so the first part of the number <laughs> 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 was forwards or backwards so, okay let's try first part of the number is uh, one seven eight the second part of the number is forgotten. Zero six five. Zero six five. Did I say, say that? Say that again. <laughs> Come on, say that again. One seven eight zero six five. Great. The third part of the number is twenty one. Repeat after me. Twenty one. Twenty one. And again. Twenty one. And again. Twenty one. And again. Twenty one. And again. Twenty one. One more time. Twenty one. The first part is one seven eight. The second part is zero six five. The third part is my age. 21. 21. Good lad. You should be so lucky. <laughs> this is more like your age. The last part. <laughs> What's the, the last part, 84. Repeat after me, 84. Uh, 84. Uh, 84. And again. 84. And again. 84. And again. 84. And again. 84. Give me the whole number. 17806521 Right. Was it? Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Sam. <laughs> now, now, now give it me back. Now my official chunker. That's what I want. Yeah. 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 You've been yeah. chunker for a long time. Yeah. Now give it me backwards. Oh, backwards. One seven eight zero six five two one eight four. So it'd be uh, four eight one two five six zero. That's eight seven one. Correct. That's it. And yet you couldn't do it at all a few minutes ago. No. So you chunked it. What we no. did. We took knew, the whole I knew thing. I could chunk. That's that's Mike's daughter's phone number, Dave. Right? <laughs> He's been doing, trying to partner her off <laughs> for years. Depends which one you're talking about. The three of them. Um, yeah. So the whole what we did, we took the number, yeah. divided it up, and into chunks. Now, if I said to you, "What's the third part?" You'd say twenty-one. Yeah, exactly. So do the same when you do the knowledge. Take a run, divide it up into three or four bits, learn that bit. We repeated it. Each bit five times. So when you're doing the knowledge, if you take a, a, a run with, let's say you've got 12 roads on it, you take the first three or four roads, call them over four, uh, at least five times, slowly, not too quickly, and then do the same with the next bit. And you'll find then when you eventually try to learn it totally, it'll be that much easier to learn. So that's one of the things that I, I did with Dean and yep. other things we did as well where we sort of I, I get the weekly... Sheets when I got to pointing, and mark up all the things I'd done in green. And what I knew, Mike, doing the knowledge twice, doing being a Worthing cab driver, Brighton cab driver. Sorry, are I you still? I, I live in Worthing. Are you still commuting from Worthing? I still, yes, yes, I still live in Worthing. And what do you do? Do you come up? You ain't one of those airport sleepers, are you? Coming up no, from Worthing? No, no, no. I usually start in the airport. Yeah. Certainly this time of year when it's busy. On the way, and I'll ring up to see if it's busy or not. 
if it's doing more than two hours, I don't bother going in there. Come mm-hmm. straight in the town. I'll start in the airport. It's going to take me up to two hours to go through the system. Generally clear my head and any bits of correspondence, phone calls and what have you. Uh, and then wherever it takes me is where I go. I don't care where I go. And then if I'm lucky, I'll get a job to Gatwick on a Sunday morning, for example, or Heathrow on the M25 yeah. or M23 and then M27 on home. Okay. So... For those who don't know, today's podcast, we're here with Mike Hughes. Me and David are here again with Mike Hughes. And Mike Hughes is uh, the runner, uh, runs completely on your own. Mike Hughes, the poppy cabs, or are you a team? It's always a team, but the committee is huge. One. Did you start it? No. Ah, I've often been accused of doing that. Uh, originally, it was started by a guy called Jonathan Myers, who that particular year, 2009, we had TFL, in their great wisdom, decided that they were going to shut a lot of the tube stations and tube lines for maintenance. Mm-hmm. One of the stations was Westminster. So on one of the radio stations, a veteran was moaning about this. And then Jonathan Myers phoned up and said, forget TFL, put me in touch with a guy and I'll, I'll take him there for nothing. And a few of the others, this is in the days when the UCG was just, just starting, all yeah. the London Taxi Drivers Forum, many of whom were on that started the UCG. And they all said, well, good, good idea, good idea, what are we going to do? I uh, don't know. Uh, Waterloo's a good place, yeah. Okay, what else? Oh, I made some phone calls. Phoned the British Legion, and they said, U- Union Jack Club, Victory Services Club, great. That first year, 14 of us lined up on Westminster Bridge. Before we'd done that, though, I thought, well, I've got to do something by the book. So I phoned the police and found out the guy who was in charge of the barriers on Westminster Bridge. They let us inside what they call the soft barriers, the outer barriers, but, of course, you couldn't go past the hard barriers. They had a concrete... Um, yep. barriers on, actually on the bridge. Those, those first two years, we had um, the policeman in charge and then TFL took over. So the three years after the first lot, 14 of us on the bridge, we had 107 on the bridge. 2018, 2019, we had in excess of 150. Cabs. Cabs aren't waiting on the bridge. Wonderful. In each, because they, after seven years of asking, they eventually gave me the use of the eastbound bus lane as well as the westbound one. 2020, five of us walked across the bridge. COVID. And subsequently to that, wonderful improvements that have been made uh, on Westminster Bridge. Of course, we've got far less of us, uh, far less space for us. But last year, we f- didn't finish till four o'clock. Uh, this year, we seem to have got around a few bits and pieces. And we finished about half past two this year. This year, how many cabs, Mike? Oh, it's always hard to say. I've got a database of 350 cabs. There's usually at least 250 of them will turn out. 150 helpers, usually at least half of that turns out as well. So just let me get this straight, right? Because I'm super impressed that on for Remembrance Sunday, yep. 250 cab drivers will turn up and take uh, veterans and any servicemen. Yeah, hang on, it's more than that because the 250 people on the database, right? they're the ones who I send the messages to and say, can you go to? But... The drivers that are actually at the stations will also muck in and help out. Yes, and Chuck. Well, I have done um, several myself. I've done Chelsea pensioners, taking them down. I've took military guys from the stations. And any military people that you pick up on that day, you don't charge. I don't know if you... Yeah, okay. uh, you I'm very impressed with the numbers of cabbies that turn up and that they actually do it on the day well, anyway. I often quote, uh, we do up to 1,000 cabs. Journeys. In fact, it's probably about 700-ish Yeah. in each direction. And this is because journeys. they couldn't get there on the day a station was closed uh, and a springboard thing into what we now do, which is to make sure they get there. And Yeah, I mean, the, the, for many years, the committee, committee has been huge. One. Well, you are huge. <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. But chunking. arguing with yourself, that's a bit difficult. <laughs> chunking. Chunky, he's chunking. By the way, what's the fourth part of the number? The 21. 84. Yeah. 21. <laughs> no, Third part Hang is on. 21. Yeah. So zero six five. I, I, no, I, I haven't asked it. I haven't asked it for some time. One seven eight zero six five twenty one eighty four. Well, you say that it's, it's six not. because when I went to pick up my um, LEBC cab from Cab Vision, I flagged the cab down outside London Bridge. Mm-hmm. He jumps in. He says, "Ah, oh, one seven eight zero six five two one eight four. Four years previously, I'd asked him that. I still remember the number. Oh, you haven't done something to me, have you? Yeah, you're, you're now. No. You're now start. <laughs> when he makes a chicken noise. Yeah, I know. My wife's going to find me naked in the street and shit at three in the morning or something now. Yeah. Saying those numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the whole point is that chunking works. Trying to fill your brain with too much too soon 
you scramble e- your bank account. Exactly. Oh, you've exactly. got to take it easy. You've got to take a little bit at a time, and you've got to repeat, repeat, and repeat again, and and repeat. There you go. But uh, there's something else to add to that, Michael. I mean, a lot of people when they come to the knowledge, they think, "Oh, shall I learn memory techniques?" Well, uh, learning memory techniques is a study in itself. Yeah. So you, you're studying the knowledge, and repeat and chunking are the simplest and most effective ideas anywhere so you don't have to go off learning memory techniques but a lot of people don't understand the value of repetition and they don't understand the value of making the information small piece that i can remember this and then add this and remember this with it added and added and added and we compartmentalize the little chunks and put them together it's an age-old tested method and it's really effective and you don't need to go off and start studying memory techniques which is a a real serious thing because it gets really really in depth and i don't know if you know mike they did a study on you know the memory competitions where you remember decks of cards and stuff yeah. like that? Well, we, we've experimented with that and it's quite fun. But they'd done real memory tests on the guys that would win these memory competitions and found that they fundamentally had below average to average memories and above average technique. Yep. So that everything they were doing was all around technique. They had no better memory brain than anybody else. So some persons can have, some people can have a actual, an actual physical good memory which they could just, just use, because some people can remember every day of their life. Hmm. But that, that's well. the phenomenon. But the guys that win the competitions with the decks of cards and everything else, no, they're nothing to do with their memory. Everything to do with the techniques that they've applied to it. And the, the basics would be chunking, but they usually use memory palaces and storytelling to create longer strings of information. Is that the same as like counting cards in a casino? Yeah. Like yeah. Against the rules, yeah. isn't it? I don't know if it's illegal, but it's against it the is, rules. Uh, no, it always seems unfair, doesn't it? I'm yeah. basically better at it than you because I can count the cards, but how would they make that illegal if it... You can do it, but they won't let you come come in there because you're they consider too good. You're too good. Yeah. It's not But they will chuck you out. Well, as they'll well. chuck you yeah, out. They'll yeah. chuck you out if they, they think you're doing get it. You out of it mm. But it's not strictly speaking illegal. And they have ways where they can detect these things. They have ways. They have ways. Well we what a skill ways. that is it's not only the fact of counting cards, it would be the weighing up of percentages. So you know that yep. the three kings have gone and there's only one king left, so therefore the percentage chances of me pulling that king that well, I need for my hand. That's where the poker players come in. Yeah, they're good at that. Yeah, I I never like. I'm not a gambler, so I leave that to my dad. That stuff. Yeah. So the whole point of this chunking thing is that you notice I I could ask you that number, any part of that number, in any order. Mm -hmm. Right. What's the second part backwards, for example? Five six zero. Okay. So when you're actually coming to doing the knowledge, if you chunked your runs rather than taking one long piece, if you're trying to work something out from an examiner has asked you, you can take a chunk from one one run, a chunk from another run, and put them together forwards or backwards, and it helps you considerably. So I always uh, try and spend time with noise students when I see them. I spend half an hour or so and say, well, try these methods of doing these things. Do you use the same number that you've just used on me for everyone? Yeah. <laughs> you have to. It's it'll, get, it'll, get, it'll get difficult, wouldn't it? So there'll be people watching, the game. everyone would have been repeating that. Oh, number. but then I might, I might then just turn around to people and say, well, you know, some, I do have a couple of numbers occasionally. But that's the same you should one have done your me. phone number, Mike. We'd have all memorised your phone number. Yes. And then when it comes to getting on Poppy Cabs, we know who to phone. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's no, phone around, no phone number on there. It's an, an email address. Because believe me, on Remembrance Sunday, I get so many phone calls, mm. It's the brain goes mad, should we say. Sure. What, what is the email? Let's, let's memorise okay. that. Okay, there's a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, one to remember mainly is poppycab at virginmedia.com. Not Poppy Cabs. Mm-hmm. Poppy cab without the S at virginmedia.com. Could you have got one of the smaller providers to s- rather than Virgin Media? <laughs> Maybe someone that was just gmail.com? Uh, Gmail causes problems when I'm sending emails of, from my other one. My main one, personal one, is mike at mikehughes.org.uk. So my name's on there. Yes. Yeah, so Could uh, you not get mikehughes at gmail.com? <laughs> gmail. Uh, the hassles I have, if I... Reply to somebody from Gmail, <coughs> and I've got an attachment or something to it, or, or it's part and parcel of a, of a, of a large group. Um, if I send from the Poppy Cab address, it accepts it, most places. If I send from Mike Hughes, well, it doesn't. I just got to remove one or two lines, or mm-hmm. bits and, pieces, and there it goes. It is the yeah, bane I of know. my life, Gmail. It is terrible. Because of spamming, there's loads of filters in place on all these things, and uh, it's terrible. So presumably uh, uh, the poppy cab one is seen as a whitelist one. Mm. But uh, when I send out, I've got, bearing in mind I've got about 350 to send out at a time, I can usually get 
hundred and fifty or so in one not in one go, in, in three or four bit chunks. With with no again? with no attachment. With an attachment. I suppose it's because it's the attachment that generally causes these yeah, problems with yeah. bulk emails. You, you I mean the, the the briefing notes, the final briefing notes, um most of it's bullshit, I know because I wrote it. But there are there are the odd chunks of chunks. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Blurring's, uh, blurring's occurring, yeah, Dave, yeah. yes. Yeah, blurring's occurring. The odd chunks of, of knowledge in there, so useful things in there. Um, most of us there for people to tick boxes, and I try and go through it so that everybody knows what's involved on the final briefing. Things like, for example, we use the bus lane at Coxborough Street. When I write that out, it's, it is recommended you go down to King Charles I Island to turn around. Notice it's recommended, not you must. With a cab driver, if you ever want help, ask. Mm-hmm. If you're really in trouble, they've got the end of the earth for you. If you tell them to do something, even if there's money involved, the second one's usually off. It's written in such a way that it's requesting cab drivers to do things. But those who've been on my briefing, final briefing, know that my introduction is always, people say, my management style is similar to that of Genghis Khan or a Tunnel of the Hun. Mm-hmm. They're totally and utterly wrong. Both those are far too left-wing for me. <laughs> and then I'll say that I appreciate you all volunteer so please remember whenever I say anything it's always a request it's just that sometimes it may sound like a command and the final bit is that um, there's every chance I may upset one or more of you before the end of the day please don't take it personally it's just that sometimes I can get too enthusiastic and from that part onwards I can get away with blue murder yeah or it seems like anyway do you know what my payment is my cab is at the front of the line on Westminster Bridge you my, show off that's the only Payment I've ever asked for. My my space is always left at the front. It's usually the last cab to leave, but um, it's always at the front. It's a magnificent thing that we, uh, you arrange and that us cab drivers get involved in with poppy cabs. I got an award last night. Uh, I, uh, we was going to get on to the award. Um, it was uh, it wasn't a BAFTA. It was Oscar. It was the Worshipful Company of Hackney Carriage Drivers. Yep, and they awarded you what exactly? Exactly, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's on my phone. It's the. Uh, I've got a picture. I'm putting it on the screen yeah, now. Put, put it on the screen. Put it on the screen now. That'll tell you. It's for, for for charity and for involved with all the charity work. And uh, you were standing alongside our good friend Tom Hartley. Tom, yeah, he was sat next to me. He he got one for the, his work that he'd done um, with helping them with PR. Yep. And uh, television stuff. Like and you was also sat next to my nephew. Your nephew, yes. Nicky O'Connor. Yes, yes, yes. Who was getting his badge that day for the tour guides for the yep. Washable Company tour. Yes. And a few of the others that were there, mm-hmm. people who've been helping me uh, in the past as knowledge boys or knowledge students and are now cab drivers. So, I mean, I'm very good at getting volunteers. I can remember one guy called Lee Martin and his friend. It must have been seven, eight years ago, maybe ten years ago. I don't, mm-hmm. can't remember. They were going over Southwark Bridge. I said, where are you going? Oh, we're... Uh, Doing some pointing, they said, Not anymore, follow me. We took them down to Great Suffolk Street and they volunteered. And Lee's still been coming there every year since. Oh, wow. He's but actually part of the senior management. I say the management team has been one. I have a, a, a gang, a group of people who I trust, really trust. Mm-hmm. Um, people like Doug Cheshire, who is the guy in charge of the vintage taxis, Lee, and a few others who, whose advice I trust. Don't always take it, but I yeah. trust their advice. And they're the people who are in the more senior positions. They know what they're doing on the day. I try, if I can, to think of everything I can before the day. On the day, it's handed over to other people. Cab drivers, left alone, know what they're doing. Cab drivers told what to do will do the exact opposite. So uh, apart from our own organisation, the Worshipful Company of uh, Hackney Carriage Drivers, recognising all the great work that you've done, surely you should be up for a knighthood. <laughs> possible. I, why yeah. is it not possible? Why not? Yeah, why not? I, I, I work nights. Is that good enough? Yeah. I, do, does that mean I've got to work night in the, nights in the hood? Uh, well, you know, these, these guys, especially the veterans and what we've ever done and what you're doing for them and it's our... Let's just get... Um, I'm going to... I know Charles. King King Charles. The first. Spaniel. <laughs> 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 Yeah, especially after you this shit, it's King, King Charles yeah. III. Are, um, are, are you getting used to the fact that everything is now, we no longer have QCs, we have KCs. We no longer have the Queen's Chapel of the Savoy. Uh, is oh, now is the King's the Chapel of the Savoy. Yeah. Obviously, I've done poppy cabs for a long time, mm-hmm. but I'm also a volunteer driver for the taxi charity for military veterans. They put me together with a guy called Major Edwin Hunt about seven, years, seven eight years ago. He, heck of a character, 
I'd taken him to Normandy and Holland several times. 2019, I think it was. It was very, very cold. He ended up hypothermic. They held, he was so bad, they held the ferry up for 45 minutes in case we had to take him off. Long story cut short, this is. We got back. I took him all the way home. He started sitting me up and he said, you should have taken him to the hospital when we got to Harwich. I said, yeah. He said, but you took me home. He said, yeah. I had another veteran with me at the time, a guy called Fred Glover. Heck of a story he's got. And then in 2011, sorry, 20, 2011, what, what? 20 past eight. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> what planet, am I on the planet Zog? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, like I said, 178. Zero six five two one eight four. See, it works. Though. It works. So last year, twenty twenty two, that's more like it. Um, the Ted's history he was born on the twenty third of March, nineteen twenty. In nineteen forty eight, twenty, he was sent to Narvik in Norway, where he had the first thing they had to do was prepare an airstrip. He was an engineer. Um, Dunkirk happened. They had to destroy everything. Pulled out. He went to work on the uh, defences in East Anglia. And then uh, he was a waterman and lighterman, who were the precursors of taxi drivers. The original taxi drivers, yep. the waterman and lightman. Yep. He and others were recruited in 1943, so that by the time D-Day came along, he was a captain in charge of 15 special low-draft rhino barges on Gold Beach. So 6th of June 1944, he was there. In 1945, he and a Dutch engineer by the name of Constance Van Brechten designed and built what became the longest all-floating Bailey Bridge of World War II. Last year, they had a commemoration to it. To him or the bridge? They opened the, for the bridge, but he was the guest of honour. Yeah, just com- I'll come back to that in a moment. So after the war, he started. He retired as a major, started a school for watermen and lightermen, and rightly claims he saved many people's lives because he mm-hmm. thought they might be safe on the water. And in 1978, he was appointed the Queen's barge master, a job he did for 12 years until he was age 70. He was pick-headed, stubborn, opinionated, cantankerous, kept trying to order people around, and would never do as he's told. Mm-hmm. And he said exactly the same about me. <laughs> which is why we got on so well. If you'd seen us together, you'd swear I was being totally and utterly disrespectful. The exact reverse is true. They knew, he, he knew, and his family knew, that, and I was told, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, he's going to go there. Because they were opening the memorial, and he was the guest of honour. Yeah. He didn't know he was the guest of honour. He knew he, was, he had something yeah. important to do there. Um, we were there for 12 days, and he would literally die. I, I carried a DNR form, do not resuscitate, which is his wishes, should something happen to him. So he knew I'd get him there. He knew I'd get him uh, back. What age was he when you was doing 102. This? Shut up. 102, yeah. So he uh, he was deteriorating. Uh, and this is where Mickey Harris comes in. I said before I left that no way was I going to go on my own with him. Somebody had to come with us. Yeah. Carer. So the family got in at Worthing. We drove to Dartford where... We met Mickey and his wife, Barbara. Barbara sat in the back with Major Ted, and they got on like a house on fire. He always liked a new audience in mm-hmm. Ted. And I didn't realise Barbara had terminal cancer mm. at the time. Great lady. Got on the, on the ferry. The guys the taxi charity, m- medics looked after Ted there. But I was really, really stressed out. But the Dutch people had arranged for three army nurses to look after him in, in turn on a rotor. If I'd been 40 years younger, she would say one of them would have made me stand to attention. And 100 years younger. Gay, <laughs> <Yeah>, oi. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in Ted's case, but not mine. Yeah, go However, um, so they, 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 it was like Atlas having the world taken off his shoulder when, mm. when they turned up. They were very good. When at the end of the thing, they gave me a bottle of whiskey, which I didn't open until a year later. And there's a reason for that. I'll tell you in a minute. So I got Ted back and he... I couldn't see him in his care home because he lived in the care homes in Worthing where I live. Uh, he kept the care home get, getting locked down for COVID. They'd locked down for 10 days and somebody else would get locked down for another 10 days. The idea was that when the taxi charity brought people to Worthing for the weekend, for the day out rather, uh, I would, had arranged to pick Ted up. I said, even if you're in the back of the cab, you can say hello to people. Yes, he said. The weekend before, he fell and broke his hip. Local doctors examined him and said, we're not going to operate because if we put him under, he's not coming back. They were hoping to get him out on the Tuesday. Didn't come out. Came out on the Wednesday. I believe I was the first non-staff member to see him. And uh, he gave me a huge hug. If I'd hugged him back with a tenth of the pressure he gave me, I'd have broken his back. And I said to him, so sorry, Ted, you know. He said, no, 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 lad. So he spoke. You gave me something so special. And uh, it meant a lot to me mm-hmm. that he said that. I arranged to see him the following Monday. I had a phone call on the Friday beforehand to say from the ward sister, 
Katie Tura, he'd come in on the Saturday. So I went in on the Saturday and uh, saw him 3 o'clock at 3.45. He wasn't conscious. Mm-hmm. I know that the last sense to go, and the first one to come back is always hearing, so maybe he heard what I said, I don't know. Um, that's why whenever you see somebody in a coma, be careful what you say. Yeah. They can often hear what you're saying. Well, I'll make sure that, that you've got that tenner you owe me. <laughs> <laughs> no, the 20 quid you owe me, I think. Isn't yeah. it? Um, oh, I tell you what, we, we both agreed, Dave, was all just both yeah. tenner. Yeah, yeah. Is that right, uh, Dave? One seven eight. I tell you what, I have about a pound for every one of those numbers. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's ten digits. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, so yeah, uh <laughs> so he uh I saw him on the Saturday, I left him at three forty five, six twenty he was dead. This is where going out on the trips with the veterans and also with the kids. I've not done the kids myself, but I know people who have done. Yeah. Because the kids are so hard work, not in a, in a nasty way, but you know, the, I, I'm an old fart. You're a nasty bastard. No, I'm an old fart, and I, I, I can take old farts around. And I can, uh, I, I'm at their pace, you would yeah, say. Yeah. But the kids, I've got no chance to keep them up with them buggers. Yeah. Um, but the drivers get attached to them, and it can be very, very emotional. So you don't realise that's that's the payback. That's not where the money goes, and uh, it's more than any. Pound not you're ever going to take. Yeah. So there you go. That's, that's I, I, it, it must be heart wrenching. I mean, every year on year you do these things and you slowly see. What's scary about it is for me is you probably become aware of your own aging and mortality. <laughs> you're seeing these people pass away and you realize every day it's getting closer and closer. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Don't you think about it now at all now you're older? Don't you think about how much time you've got left? No, I, I don't. Yeah. I, We've done it, me and you have both made changes. And I've made changes because I um, I had my first child when I was 47 and my second when I was 49. So it means I'm an old dad. Um, I still like to think I'm fit and healthy, but as soon as I had those children and I'm watching them grow, I suddenly have become even more and more aware that I need to stay around as long as possible because there's nothing more beautiful than seeing them and, no, and watching them and, and the things to come in the future. And obviously making them safe and trying to give them a foundation that they can build upon from me so i'm more and more aware of my mortality now and anyone our age i hate to hang say on hang on wait till you get to my age you're, well you're really you're old. youngsters you are <laughs> you're really you won't even make it to the end of this podcast <laughs> <laughs> hang on is that a 45 you've got there then? <laughs> oh no you just <laughs> no but every single one of my best friends except one is dead so most of the kids that I grew up with, the all best friends, didn't make it into their fifties, Dave. It's, it's like, so we're lucky, and in that sense, though, me and Dave have both stopped drinking, and I'm, I, we're not stopped drinking forever. That's not no, our plan. Just take breaks. Like, yeah. yeah. So, but it is more the fact of be aware that if you're, a lot of people don't realise that you've been drinking every day because that's the culture that you get into. You don't yep. realise that you just had a gin and tonic today, and you think that you just had a lemonade. No, you had a gin and tonic today. And then you had three gin and tonics or a beer the other day, and every day there was an alcohol drink in well, your system. I'm antisocial. I grew up in the days when uh, you were antisocial if you were a non-smoker. Everybody smoked. Yeah. Flashy ash, and you did. I was never smoked. Never. Did you uh, smoke? When I was younger, yeah. yeah. I did, well, I say young. I think I started at about 25 years old, like a lunatic. Yeah, I was in Tenerife yeah, or something like that. Great. When I was two-year-old, um, my uncle smoked a... Uh, uh, pipe and they give me one of these clay pipes and you know, kidney ones. I took some tobacco and smoked it like a trooper. I never wanted anything afterwards. That's the only time I've ever smoked it. And I very rarely drink because I've been in a job where I pick up the pieces of drunken drivers. Mm. And <clears throat> with kids and family, I've always been the driver. So your kids go at night time, you go and pick them up. I used to drink a little bit when I had the printing business. And for night time, I was scotch or whatever. So I rarely drink. I mean, I was out last night and drank no alcohol. And that was an event to be at. You was at your worshipful company award presentation. Yeah. I'd have been blistered on the floor. Me and Dave would have been home by Wednesday. Uh, well, yeah, I definitely would have stayed in a hotel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been out on booze ups, absolute piss ups. When I've come away with my sides aching with laughter at the antics of everybody else. Yeah. That and next morning is great. I, mean, I remember one year going to a show with the Model Row Club. The night before, I had eight pints of water. And next morning, they're all there, oh, my head. I said, come on, lads, some nice greasy bacon and sausages here. Oh, oh that's lovely after a night, eh? Yeah. 
<laughs> so it, it's great, great to laugh at the antics of other people. Where was the award ceremony? Whereabouts was it? In the Waterman's Hall, which was great for me because um, that, of course, Ted Hunt was a waterman. The Lovely. association was uh, serendipity, serendipitous. Was uh, the master of the Waterman's there? Lady Master. Master of the yeah. Waterman's is a taxi driver as well. Is it? Yes, Simon McCarthy. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah. Wasn't Waterman classed years and years ago, classed part of being a taxi to get him across before yeah. there was bridges? He, he said yeah. about half an hour ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he was, he was, well, was still thinking of his number. Were you, in this, were you in this room? No. He was doing his number in there. What's the third part of the oh, number? Okay. Uh, 178065. Two one eight four. Yeah, he, was, he was going. Over. I, don't know, I think you switched me off. There, so, right? Michael, <laughs> I know that you're a historian <laughs> thingy, but enlighten us. What are the lightermen? Lightermen are in charge of barges that move goods, and watermen are in charge of barges that move people, and they're often interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So there you go. There you go. My father-in-law was a lightman. Was he? Yeah. Who's dad? Was yeah. He? How long? How long ago was, was he a lightman? When, when he's still he alive now. He's uh, eighty-nine, ninety. He's still, he's still, he's still got got a barge. Barge. ninety in March. Ask him if he knew Ted Hunt because Ted Hunt probably trained him. Mike Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he would have done. He probably would have done. Yeah, he, he was on the school, barges on that. The school in when they built the Limehouse Link, I was driving tippers taking the muck away. He was taking the muck away on the barges down to Tilbury. Still we, working on it. We were both working at the same time on the same projects. Yeah. Wow. On the Limehouse Link, when they built the Sink, both Link tunnels and the Westford West River. When See, they built Canary Wharf. For me, the Limehouse Link wasn't that far back in history. I mean, obviously, uh, I was. Uh, late 80s, 90s, was it? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. When did they do well, it? Well, it, it wasn't built when I drove the cab first time. It was the second time. Yes. And that, that's why, first time, it took me 21 months. Uh, second time, two years, five months, five days. I didn't count the hours and minutes. Yep. Um, and Limehouse Link hadn't been done. Canary Wharf had not, hadn't been developed. Mike, the first time you did the knowledge, they hadn't even built St Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> Actually, we, at the beginning, I said that I could tell you about the, um, the present methods as well. When I went up for, I went up with the four hundred runs, mm -hmm. and I went up. I was on the very last presentation, and the examiner came out and said, "We're going to have new ones starting in February. We've got three hundred and twenty runs, and half the people got up and walked out." Think they thought it was easy. <laughs> well, I knew because you goodness. had already had maps of the 400 runs. But if they've got map tests of the 320s, they're all going to be new. You've got nothing you can swat up on. Luckily, I mean, when they gave me my map test, is one I, I practiced with you, mm -hmm. and they gave me one around Bruton Street, yeah. and or West End, because I used to walk the beat around there. So I knew all them were okay. Um, lucky. Uh, so, and I went through on the 400. But my call of a partner, Steve Meffham, when I first met Steve, he said, oh, I used to be a minicab controller. He said, I know London very well. I said, no, you don't. Yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. Six months later, he said, hmm, maybe I didn't. Yeah. Uh, we got to a point with Steve. He said, I used to say to him, do this. He said, I don't agree with you. He said, but I better do it to save you turn around saying, I told you so. Uh, because I'd done it before and I could see what, and I just a little bit, of, not a lot further in, in front of him. So he was on the 320s and I was on the 400s. What's interesting, he would call over on the 320 runs. I remember, I think it was Wilkins gave me, one of them gave me a, a question, which was from the new book, the 320 book, and I called it. Mm -hmm. But I had to work it out. I think it's Castlane Road, is it? Um, so sort of... Um, Might have been, there is, um, I don't, I wouldn't so know. So sort of Hammersmith Bridge. Yeah. To wherever it went. I actually worked it out in my head. And then so afterwards, Steve said, oh, that's part of our, uh, of our new books. No, you mean Castle Nor, not Castellane Road. Castle Nor, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Castellane Road yeah, is Warrington Prison. Yeah. 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 Look, hang on. It's a long time since I've done the knowledge. It's okay. Yeah. None, none of us, we all passed it. There is no shame at all for any of us. We don't need to know anything anymore. I had trouble finding my place I had to go to three weeks ago. York. York. Yeah. From Oh, you had a York, yeah? We've yeah. talked about Big Fairs, so what did you earn on that one? I'm not going to tell you. I could tell you, but I have to, I have have to, to kill, kill you. Oh, dear. Oh Put it this I, way, I am up, up until that point, the first I'd been was Leeds, and that was about 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, it was the night when they had all the storms and mm -hmm. all the wi overhead wires had come down, and up comes the, oh, I hate to say this, I don't get, oh, I don't put it on very often. Um, uh, you don't morning. have to, it's okay. you can put it on and it's worked, I think we it should stop, stop knocking it all. So I, um, the marshals come up, and they were on 10% that night, not 20, they, uh, they came out. I said, two people here to go to Peterborough. Staff. Okay, no problems. Oh, when you drop them off, take this gentleman to, to York. Okay. Wasn't until I got to Peterborough, worked it out, it's 102 miles to York from Peterborough. Mm -hmm. Back to my home was 280 miles. Five hours. Round trip. 
What, in the, you put the turbo on? <laughs> no. Five hours back. I, I, I've now got the TXE. Five hours back. Five hours back. Yeah. I've now, now got the TXE. It's lovely. You go up the A1, um, stick the cruise control on 67, 68, mm-hmm. 70 in some places. When it's 60, stick the cruise control on 60, 62. When it's 50, 52. And you can go, oh, cruise control. Yeah. Hardly ever use the brakes. And it was nice and simple and easy. And not so rattly. You want an old, not an old yeah. rattler. Well, my first experience of cruise control was in 1980. I'd taken a five-week holiday in Canada, which is when I'd first in the cab trade, and had a cab, a car with cruise control. Great it was. I mean, it takes some getting used to because it would actually accelerate where you would normally be decelerating. Came back, got in the cab. How the hell am I to turn the steering wheel? I don't know. It was such a difference because there was no steering, no power steering, no power, steering, yeah. no power brakes in those days. It took me two or three weeks to get used to it because you must not get used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, sp- we spoke about this yesterday with um, when Peter was here. Peter of uh, uh, Spandau Ballet fame. <laughs> when I passed out, every taxi driver would say to you, "How's your knee?" And because you would never have really, if you spent a day shift where you're working hard, you never would have broke and accelerated, broke and accelerated. The legs coming up, and you get this pain in the knee about here, and everybody kind of knew it. But if you imagine you had the same thing with the manual, yep, doing a twelve-hour shift in a manual, changing gears through the streets it of London, it was heavy. I got a, I got an automatic after one week. That's it. Well, when you first started, you had yep. to, you had the horse, didn't you? <laughs> was that manual? Or the manual is it? It was Emmanuel. <laughs> was the uh, horse's name? It was handsome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh it get worse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So. This year was a great year for poppy cabs. Is it looking is is it looking like something that we can sustain? Um, this is fourteen years I've done it. Yep. And it would be nice to find somebody who could take it over. I've got an, an unusual set of skills. And yep. that's not being boastful. Of things I've done. It I have a group of people who between them got the skills, but they're no also one wants very, to take they're it. They're also very busy. So we need a replacement for you, Mike. Yep. You need to rest. You've well, done your special work is over. You need a rest. I've had one need replaced. I've got the other one to be replaced sometime early next year. Yeah. So who knows? Because when I broke my leg uh, in 1975, it was very, very bad. Mm-hmm. They couldn't replace it then. I was too young. And the technology hadn't gone far enough. So they did that in 2005. And I had... Uh, so are you walking better now? Because I know no. you've had, I've seen you over the years. You've had some bad spells. Yeah, no, not anymore. Because my left leg's gone. That was my right leg was bad, oh and um, I was back at work seven and a half weeks afterwards after the yeah. operation. You know, if Mister Price was here, he'd say they'd take you outside and put you down. <laughs> <laughs> First job back, go on. Heathrow, but well, I take it nice and easy. Heathrow to Stansted on the meter. Was it a two leg job? <laughs> two leg job. <laughs> no. I just did, did, did the one leg. Did you rank up at Heathrow then? And yeah. took your first job as... First job back after my... After you you M25 did, obviously. Of course, yeah. Yeah. First first job back after my... And that, I worked one day, took two days off. Worked one day, took two days off. To gradually work my way back in and back yeah. home. Are you still working hard in the cab now or not so much? I'm still working. Yeah. I usually get about 40 hours in, in three nights. Okay. What? 40 hours in three nights. Well, you're doing plenty then uh-huh. still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. my other question is, I mean, obviously you're like 107 years old as of now. Uh, but when you came into this podcast, you I was, was only 77. 77. Six, yeah, 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 76. Now you've just aged. But um, how are you finding the medical each year? Uh, Easy? The strange thing is, it's actually good for me because I always get um, a <coughs> blood test done a month beforehand. And I can speak to the doctor about that and other bits and pieces. So it, they, they found out about my enlarged prostate and bits and other things I uh, had um, high blood pressure that's sorted out mm-hmm. uh, one stage until I lost my weight I was uh, on metformin because on what they call pre-diabetes lost the weight that's now come off yes you was a big man back yeah then. I still am well, well parts parts of you are not yeah. anymore not not taking the, since taking those pills not. I can remember you wobbling up the stairs in Watts Grove to get to the first floor it was got a bit difficult I wobbled up here yeah, a little <laughs> while ago uh, yeah so it's it's actually, I think it's actually good for me because it makes me look after myself mm-hmm. and I just double check everything's working basically. Yeah, because well, this is one of the things, again, talking about the special things of our job. Um, 
we are working for ourselves and we can go on and for as long as we're healthy enough. And uh, as long as we can keep passing the medicals. I'm shocked you keep passing the medicals, a man of your calories. I um, think to I rest is to rest, though. Yeah. To rest, it, you're right, Dave. Absolutely. Well, just, just, just looking at you two devils, I mean, I think I seem to have weathered life a lot better than you two put together. <laughs> well, <laughs> They've only got six months left between us. Well, I'm chunking still. You're chunking. <laughs> What's the number backwards? I'm, and I'm uh, blurring. Blurring is occurring. <laughs> The number backwards. Yeah. So that'd be four eight one two. Yep. Five six zero eight seven one. It works. Uh, just a, another little Everyone's point. Everyone's gonna think that's completely the, set up. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 la, the last two bits. Um uh, another way of association. What's twenty one times four? Forty eight. No. <laughs> 84. Yeah. And what's the last part of the number? Yeah, backwards. You yeah. thought he was saying yeah. you're going backwards. You've got me backwards and forwards. So <laughs> you, you, you can do other associations as well. And you've confused Chunk. me now. I've got it. Now, <laughs> lost lost it. now 84 is gone because you've got 48. Yeah. Oh, I've lost it. <laughs> you've mangled his brain. He's now spaghetti. Yeah. You've blurred me. Yeah. <laughs> blurred oh, anyway, okay. as I said, when I got picked up from London Bridge, the, the guy rattled the number off and he paid forward the fare. Do you, do you know you've met Dave before? Yes, I picked him up. Yeah. yeah. Him and his missus. Covid, as a fair. It was one. Yeah. Of, it was. It wasn't full covid. We was in one of those where we could go in someone's garden if we rolled a trouser leg up and stood on one leg. Oh, and yeah, that was, yeah, something and like if that. If you had a friend with uh, the prime yeah. minister at the time, you could and, do that. And if you were chunky like yep. me, you could, you're fine. And yeah, uh, yeah and, and thankfully I got a cab and it was he could come and pick me and my wife up until oh. it was home. He, yeah. he, did he did he know the way or did he get lost? No, I got lost. Yeah, we was all lost. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he, he was pissed. Drunk. He was. <laughs> He was well pissed. I did manage to sell him a, a public guard badge, though. Yes. I gave you one, didn't I? Yeah, for my wife, you did, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. 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 Did you I, tell him you was I, a cabbie? The cabbie at the time, I thought, Yeah, yeah, I did. No, I was, yeah. yeah. No, I was at the time, yeah. Yeah, it was 2020, I was, yeah. yeah. Well, there was nowhere to go. Oh, well, you, you was out boy. working. I think you were... Oh. When, we, when we looked to try to get a cab, there was none, and just one came along. It was like, you know, a scene from 1960s do with, do a, do with do a fog, do or the 50s with the smog. Do <laughs> and this cab came through, and it was poppy cabs <laughs> come through and poppy got us home. If it had been foggy, can you just imagine how you would have felt, you know, yeah. out of the fog? Well, it looked foggy to me after all those John Smiths. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he, he'd had a few. What were you doing working during COVID? Uh... <laughs> First four months, I didn't work at all. I had to get some tyres. Kevin gets some. I thought I'd just work a little bit. I did a couple of hours. I only did three or four jobs. Mm. But people like Get and the others, they kept you work coming. You paid the twenty percent because you didn't have any choice. Uh, but I remembered because uh, they they went from fifteen to twenty immediately. We had went lockdown. It sticks in the craw, I should we say that is. Well, but there's there's a double sided coin there because without it, there was nothing. Exactly. So you we going to be grateful for one yeah. thing. Yeah. A lot of people got could survived because of that. Yeah. And luckily, I mean I'd worked it out with my pensions. I could just about survive without but I couldn't pay for holidays, couldn't pay for yeah. working around the house. If the dog was sick, couldn't pay for that. It would just about pay the bills. I thought, do I retire do I no? I mm. I like being a cup I come to work because I want to. I love it. It wouldn't surprise me. If you let your badge lapse and you went and done the bloody knowledge again. <laughs> but, oh, that brings us on to another no. thing. Doing, getting your badge lapsed now is nothing like it was when you did it. Tell me more. If you've let your badge lapse for even 20 years, it yep. doesn't matter. You can now go back and have a retest that involves a one-off test. And in that one-off test, if you can show that you've still got what you need to drive a cab, you'll, give in, you'll get your badge back straight away. If you fail it, you get two more chances, but you can go up and you can express. They give you a scoring system. Yeah, yeah. So you can get your badge back within one to three appearances of a different kind of appearance, where there's a lot of leeway. We've done a video about it yesterday and we've done a few in the past. And I think it's excellent because doing the knowledge once, what a, you know, we've done a magnificent thing, making someone like yourself, and you're not the only example, are you? I've got loads in my school who have done physically done the knowledge twice, and I could name four people straight off the top of my head. So now you don't have to do that, and now you can get back your badge very, very quickly. God, I did all that work for no... no. Well, you'd, you'd have to wait until now, so you'd be 77. Yeah. It only to, came to, in a year ago. To be ago. fair, it took me two and a half years. I was treated fairly. I worked me nuts off, as you know. Yeah. Uh, even though sometimes people thought, oh, you were given something. No, I wasn't. They treated me exactly the same as anybody else. On my on my first 21, only 21, I turned up. I was in the cafe opposite with one of the 
the knowledge point collectors. In comes Courtney Connell, and he says, "Right, come over quickly." He said, um, "Oh, Courtney was an examiner at this time that you're there, was, okay?" Yeah. Mr. Price and myself, the only two in. Mm -hmm. So all the things I do, oh shit, oh well, no good, all learning all that lot. And um, in the end, I just relaxed. Mm -hmm. Went in there, Mr. Price said, asked me a number of questions. One of them, he, he, he said, take me from Arsenal Football Club to Chelsea Football Club, and I laughed. So excuse me, sir, but one of my call of partners is lives in, uh, is an Arsenal supporter, the other one's a Chelsea supporter. Now again, the beautiful thing in that day, backtracking a bit, one of my call of partners was Steve Meffham, lived in Thornton Heath, no problems. The other guy was Dave, he, was, he lived in St Albans. And I live in Worthing, you couldn't get much further apart if you tried. But we would spend over an hour each day on the phone calling over. And you can cheat, of course you can cheat. But who are you cheating? Only yourself. And so uh, we called over a lot, hell of a lot. Call over, call over, call over. Yeah. And we repeated, repeated and repeated. And that's what paid. One of the little tricks that would tell people, don't let them know what you know. Make everything look harder than what it is. So if they've asked you two football clubs and you've got, you know the answer already, don't be flash. Make it look much, much harder than it really is and yeah, stretch I, the question. But by this time, he'd already asked me three and I think it was... You're in the bag. Uh, I, I knew that there was a likelihood I was going to score, should we say. Mm. I didn't know what the score was going to be, double A. Yeah. But um, Did you get any double A's on your trip through? Uh, that was my double A. Okay, double I'm, a. I'm in your uh, Hall of Fame. I was from, a long time ago. Yes, from Mr. Price. You know, I've lost that document. I, I have no idea where oh, it is. Because on that, on that document is Peter Gardner, who had five appearances. They were all double A's and A's. There was no B's, C's. Yeah. The, so he did it in the modern era on just five appearances. Wow. And Peter Gardner was completely unique in that sense. He didn't do the knowledge super, super quickly. I mean, he'd done it in about two years. But... It depends on how long you spent studying to get ready for it. And he was a school teacher before, um, but I am not aware of anybody really doing it in less than 10. So for him to halve it, you have to look at it, and I can't remember the bloody scorecard, but it is five. It'd have to be a double A, and a double A would take... Well, three double A's would give you the knowledge. Yeah. So in some senses, there's two A's, and you have to spread that out to make... Three yep. levels of appearances, but that's what he done. I, I scored in everything except one. I richly deserved my D. Mm -hmm. I think it was my first 20, 28th. Believe me, it made me double down from that point onwards. Yeah. Who, do you I remember who that was who gave you that? Uh, was it a man? Mr. Yes. Chris? Mr. Bishop? No, no. Be before, uh, Bishop is the one that gave me my, my badge in the end. So yes, he would have been the head examiner. He would have been Skull at the time. But yeah, Bishop gave me the exam, not, not Price. Mm. Um, so Bishop and, and Courtney Connell were there on that day. Yeah. And who was the examiner? Previously, he'd done every tube station on the circle line. I studied the whole lot. Oh, I think I nearly can remember. But there was, somebody, there was Bob Hoskins was one. That no. was, uh, people think we're talking about Bob Hoskins, the actor, but there was a Bob Hoskins examiner. Yeah. Uh, there was Mr. O'Keefe. O'Keefe. Yeah. O'Keefe, that's the one. He, yeah, he, he was a great examiner. He was great. Because you'd, you'd get his lists, and they were very rarely repeated. Never repeated. Mm -hmm. He'd always have something. I'm trying asked, to remember all the examiners now. He'd, he'd ask every tube station though. and I'd work it out going, if you go one way you can do one and go the opposite way I really studied for him and he, I, I was expecting to get him on my 21s because he wasn't there mm -hmm. I thought well I just relaxed I'll take what comes and that's I think when you relax is when things sort of come into your brain a bit better absolutely this is another thing that I touched upon the other day with another student um, when you for example don't Build up this fear about having Mark Gunn and Jay Patel. If you get the exam that makes you afraid, take it. I don't care attitude. Once you don't care, you're more relaxed. And what will be will be, and you perform. But if you do the opposite and unheightened the tension within yourself, you function even less. Take that with you when you go out. Because I get people sometimes, um, they say, we need to be there in 20 minutes. And you know damn well it's going to take 30. And I say, Can you go any faster? Oh, no. So you might be in a rush, I'm not. And it's, what will be, will be. It's um, There's a secret number, or used to be a secret number, if it still applies. If you're going to 30 mile an hour zone with a dual carriageway, for example, it's 28. Mm -hmm. If you average 28 miles an hour, you'll get fewer red lights than if you go faster or slower, depending on the time of day. If you're going in in the morning, it's phase for coming in, evening, phase for going out. You must never hit a traffic light, Dave. You always do 28. That's fast, 20. <laughs> I don't know that fast. <laughs> the, 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 most of these days, 20. But you, 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 you get used to the sequences and you just keep going. Yeah. 
I mean, one of the um, things when we go to Holland with the technical charity, I'm, I'm butterflying now, um, we are taken with the police that gives an escort in Holland. We don't stop at traffic lights. We don't stop at junctions. You just keep going. Mm. Uh, we do 90 in, on the motorway, kilometres an hour. Yeah. Um, but everything else. And it's, it's not the speed, it's the continuity that counts. I, I was told that by somebody in, in the police a long time ago. It was a Brighton knowledge compare. Why, what was that? Brighton, I was on the first Brighton and Hove knowledge. Mm -hmm. have, uh, Brighton was one town, mm -hmm. Hove was another town, and they became a city, Brighton and Hove City. Yep. And you did the noise for Brighton, um, and that covered Dyke Road Avenue was the, the middle line. Dyke Road Avenue, um, one side of the road, the houses would be so many hundreds of thousands, the other side would be £10,000 more because it had a Hove address rather than a Brighton address. Um, so I did both, Brighton and Hove. So I was on the first one for that. You mean you did leave on left seafront, set down on seafront, and that was it? <laughs> There's only three, places, only three directions you can go. Yeah, the seafront and back again. East, west and north. <laughs> you, could, you couldn't go south. That's true. <laughs> How long does it take? Five months. Five months. And you're driving to... It's a long, it's a long it, seafront, though. I would say <laughs> in, in terms of the standards, it certainly was there. I think it still is. It's one of the highest in the country outside of London. Yeah. Are yeah. you sure? I mean, I don't know anything about the other standards, well, but I think that's a bold statement. In, in, well, in England. I know Scotland's got, Edinburgh's got, a, got yeah. quite a good time. Got so bigger than any of the cities, Brighton, no, which is a seaside town. Well, for a town, yeah. it was a town then. I, sh I should think people like, a place like Manchester. Birmingham, uh, Liverpool, Birmingham, they, Coventry. They've got yeah. better ones, obviously. But Brighton is amongst the, the top yeah. the top ten, I would think. Yeah. So you can't just buy a badge in Brighton, you have to no, just... You, 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 you buy the license for the cab. Yeah. And they change hands. Can, is there like, um, I go down to Brighton and I want to be a cab driver. Is there waiting lists? Don't know. Not at the moment. So, because there can be, I think, in some of these places. They don't. Oh, hang on. If you want to buy the cab. They have a cap. Yeah, they, they, they cap the number of taxis. Mm -hmm. So you buy the cab from another cab driver with a car. Oh, right. And, but you, and you, also, you also then have to do a little bit of a knowledge to be the driver of it. Oh, yeah, you've got to do the knowledge before. But I could rent that out to a driver who's already got it. Yep. So that's similar to the American system of yep, passing yep. the badge of the medallion on. Yep, which is what caused who would come along. <sighs> mm -hmm. So to recap, the first time you did the knowledge in, in 1977, how long did that take? 21 months. 21 months. Five months on the Brian. We're at 26 months. And how, how long the second one? Two years, five months, five days. Hey, I doubt. There you go, yeah. So what, What's the average now? To be honest with you, I think it's coming down quite quickly. Not because of anything to do with it getting easier, but people are reaching the level quicker, which is all about the numbers. The people that are studying at the moment, because they're so low numbers, are usually the ones that are studying harder. And full-time? If you're full-time, you're definitely going to be around the two-year mark. Bang on. Two, two years, two years, six months? No, no th I think if you do two years, six months full-time, then you had a little bit of bad luck. Because uh, you get one or two appearances where you had bad luck, that's going to make it two oh, years, yeah. six months. But in general, if you've worked hard and you got it right and you're full time, you're going to be looking at two years thereabouts, right on the button. And when you did it, how long was you on it? Uh, three days less than two years. April was 9th, 1990. No, normal would have been two years, three months, five months, two years, six months for full timers. Yeah, about what I did. Yeah. And part timers. At that time I was doing it, there were still people there doing it 14 years at that time, yep. which is amazing. Because mm. um, this is the, what caused all the knowledge to change because there was a generation of people that were told, sign on the knowledge. You don't even really have to, you know London, like, you know, sign on and do the appearances. And they found that the, the appearances are real. You have to actually be able to be good at something and articulate your route. But they would persevere because they was told, you know, eventually they pass you out. And to be honest, they did kind of. But you could be there for 13, 14 years and there was lots of people from that generation that did that. And it meant that the numbers on the knowledge was enormous. There were 6,000 people on knowledge because they could sign on for free and just do it. And that's why they brought in the map tests. Mm. Yes. And actually... It them out. It filtered them out too well over time once the yeah. Uber situation kicked in. And that's when they should have reversed policy and allowed a, f a kind of a flood again because they had no one to examine. There's no one actually on the knowledge at all. What I don't get in my first time, it, 21 months, where one guy took nine months, because, but he was literally on a cycle, yep. day in, day out, seven days a week, going around everywhere, looking at everything. He was brilliant. Um, 21 months is about average for uh, the first time. 
two and a half years second time because of the map test was mm-hmm. put, you know nowadays people have not even put in for map testing until they've done all the runs so that's 12 months gone before you even start that's it they're not they've got to follow a pattern that's going to get through quickly which is that my pattern would be you've got to do 16 runs a week you finish this part in six months you're going to be on the written test around about seven eight nine month mark and as you get past that you're on appearances and if you score straight c's it's a year a year on appearances yep. so if you have some bad luck you still got space to be at two year mark and if you have several stages but of bad luck you're at two and a half years which makes the knowledge reasonable but they don't power trouble is this. a lot of them will wait to even put in for the map test they're actually ready but they don't realize they're ready but well, they, they believe they're never ready, don't I mean, we? So. Was, this has happened with Steve Beppen. He waited and waited and waited. Yep. And he asked, you've got to do this. And in the end, he said to me, well, okay, I don't believe you're right, but I'm going to do it to stop you turning around and saying, I told mm. you so. Yeah. And that was it. So um, I think you always feel like that. You're never good enough. Of course you do. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The idea is you've got to be on appearances. If you're not on appearances, you're nowhere. And someone actually quoted me that saying, <laughs> <"Let's put Yeah. laughs> quotes Dean Warren, and if you're not on the appearances, you're nowhere. Well, you're not on the knowledge, are you? <laughs> no. And it's better to be on appearances, just for those that want to know, it's better to be on appearances getting Ds than it is to not be on appearances and getting nothing. Because with the Ds, you're at least getting the, the idea of, this is nerve-wracking. You're, you're taking some experience back from that yep. that you can correct and keep moving on from. So no matter how great you could be outside of the knowledge, uh, outside of appearances, when you start appearances, you might find you're failing anyway because you've now got the hurdle of, I can't do this. This is a, a pressure situation. The sheer pressure you get. Uh, the adrenaline in your, in your body. I mean, how many times have you been up there? You come away afterwards and you're totally drained. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that feeling when you actually get the badge, um, euphoria, Yeah. you end up shaking it's because relief, the adrenaline needs to come out of your body. Relief, it's over. Yeah. What do you, I used to go home and go to sleep after nearly every appearance. I used to go to the pub. Mike, it's always wonderful to see you. And we've been, um, I'd say we've been friends for 20 years nearly. Um, yeah, give or take a bit. Yeah, you've been a pain in the ass every one of those years. And as you point you out yourself, you are cantankerous. You are yep. um, many of those long, big words that you can say that come from your posh background that I can't repeat. Posh. <laughs> <laughs> Dragged up in the valleys, I was, mate. <laughs> Charlton? Anyway, thank you, Mike. Tidy down there, see, tidy. Tidy, yeah, I've got you as a bloody shit. Bally, I am, originally, see.